to thank all my friends for coming tonight. <laughs> I don't know, either I have a lot of friends or I have to reach out harder to the uh, larger groups. It's not been too successful. Anyway, I just want to say that uh, this is sponsored by the Environmental Management Council and the Eastmark Tompkins, as well as um, Campaign for Renewable Energy, Cornell Cooperative Extension, uh, Sustainable Tompkins, Tompkins County Climate Protection Initiative, and thanks for the help from Social Ventures. And uh, I'm going to be very brief here. As a matter of fact, I'm going to introduce our friend Peter Bardaga, who you, more of you know him than you know me. Uh, so anyway, but Peter is the coordinator of the Tompkins County Climate Protection Initiative and uh, also the executive director of the 2030 district. So Peter will introduce Jay. Thank you. <laughs> thanks, Brian. Um, and, and thanks for everything you do, Brian. You know, you're just tireless uh, when it comes to your effort. Yeah. Persistence does pay off. Um, so thanks everyone for being here tonight. As uh, I think some of you are aware, we're having a little conversation about energy in town and greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, I just ran across a map the other day that I showed a chickpea of the awareness of uh, climate change by county in the Northeast. And it was amazing because there was one county that was like off the charts, and I mean only one county in this map that I was looking at covered Pennsylvania, Vermont, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Connecticut, parts of Maine, and it was Tompkins County. And it just, it just jumped out. And I was like, you know, we're having some kind of impact here, all of us in this room. And uh, I, I think we are, making a difference. Um, somebody else who's been making a difference is, is Jay Egg, and we're really uh, privileged to have him here uh, this evening. Uh, a longtime uh, internationally recognized geothermal energy expert who is currently focused on uh, geothermal energy utility. Um, and personally being a fan myself of scaling up um, tried to do that in the wind project or something. <laughs> um, but at, at, at any rate, I think you know this is a really important piece of the puzzle. Um, Jay's written at least two books and several articles on geothermal HVAC systems. And God bless him, he's a consultant with NYSERDA. That takes <laughs> persistence as well. <laughs> Having personally uh, had some uh, time to uh, play on that field. Um, Jay started his business back in 1999 when he was working on geothermal air conditioning systems in, in Florida. Um, and uh, of course, Florida's changed a lot since then in lots of different ways, climate not the least of them. Um, he co-authored with Brian Howard for McGraw Hill a book on the subject of geothermal HVAC uh, that was published in 2010, and he was also a co-author uh, of a graduate level textbook from McGraw Hill on uh, modern geothermal HVAC engineering and controls applications, and that got published in July 2013. I, I do want to confess, though, that what most intrigues me about Jay's thinking is um, an article that I that I read on. Um, the difference between carbon neutral and net zero energy. Um, it's a distinction, to be honest, had eluded me previous to that, but I think it's really an important one, and I look forward to Jay having a chance to address that as well, because it, it really is very relevant to a conversation we're having now in town. Um, the 2030 district, as I think at least some of you know, is uh, established in downtown Ithaca and has a goal of buildings becoming uh, net zero um, by 2030. Um, uh, so it's something that, that is certainly close to my heart and a, a concern, I think, of all of us. 
you know, exactly what do we mean when we talk about net zero energy. So without further ado, uh, it's my honor to introduce Jay. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Thank you so much. Wow, if these are all um, friends of Brian, I think he's got a good group of friends. I, I'm really impressed. I was, uh, it's been a busy day for me. I started in Binghamton at the, um, the Kaufman what is it? Center. Kaufman Center, a geothermal building, and they had three news stations there and all kinds of cool things. I'm kind of used to it. New York has been very good to me, and I love the state of New York. I love the state of New York because no, and, t and now we're in the epicenter of where it's really happening because all the time I've been in New York on NYSERDA business, consulting, doing architecture and engineering classes last fall and everything else, I'm on several consulting projects for them now through uh, uh, larger projects into community, uh, community involvement and community wide geothermal applications and in building codes now we're working on some building codes so there's a lot of stuff going on here and I have heard over and over again Tompkins heat smart Tompkins this is a famous place and we're at the epicenter of it and you know I have never I I just left Cornell's campus I was talking to Jeff Tester he invited me over after the Binghamton thing we sat there and talked about all kinds of things and uh, we've done DOE projects before together and uh, you know as I was booking this trip and things kept going on I'm going to be in Oneonta tomorrow going through a SUNY campus and I, I started trying to connect all the dots and I can't quite get my arms around everything that's going on so I am just here to say that the cool thing about my um, involvement. Uh, I was a contractor engineer for 20 years and in 2010 after writing that first book I, I basically got to uh, sell my businesses and start consulting and it's been a lot of fun because it's been fun because I haven't had any employees that's super fun going from 50 employees to, to none and letting somebody else take care of them and also I marched to the beat of my own conscience and my own drum and um, I think that, you know, I would call, I would say I'm a geothermal evangelist. I'm definitely, as, as Peter said, I'm a um, net zero emissions evangelist. Uh, you know, it really is important. I've, uh, it was hot yesterday, <coughs> really hot. And... Uh, I, the people I talked to said, yeah, it should be pretty cool this time of year. And we have another hurricane heading to who knows where. We've got one that just hit the Gulf and another one coming. It looks, I haven't looked at it since yesterday, but I remember Sandy and I, I, I just had my roof replaced last week from Irma from last year because there were so many roofs that got torn off. Uh, fortunately, it wasn't too terribly bad. We lost our pool cage. Oh, poor Jay, he lost his pool cage, right? You know, but you know, it, and we lost a good part of our roof, but you know, uh, I, th I always like to tell people, hey, you know, Earth has a way of fixing uh, climate change. If it gets too hot, it just makes more hur hurricanes. Hurricanes are Earth's cooling medium. The only problem is we kind of, level out humanity at the same time. Poor Puerto Rico, you know, those folks in, in, in Texas. And you know what? The Earth is gonna, uh, going to, uh, until we get to that tipping point where it just goes crazy, the Earth is going to normalize itself. Those are the, the cooling fans for, for when we get too warm and, and some years there's a lot and some years there's less. It just seems like, uh, it seems like who knows, um, where, but I do know one thing. I know one thing for certain. Uh, when I got into this technology back in 1990, uh, I um, knew it was a, a technology that, that answered a lot of problems, which we'll talk about today. But I didn't realize how dangerous uh, greenhouse gas emissions were, or even more so, how dangerous methane 
was, if you go onto the NOAA website, which is where I check the hurricanes, uh, and you go into tropical, they have a, I wish I had a slide for this, it says 28 times more efficient. And you go, oh, this looks good, and so you read it, and if anybody goes onto the tropical page, they'll see this on the NOAA website. It's been up there for at least a couple of months, because that's when I first noticed it. And it says methane is 28 times more efficient at trapping heat than anything else that we're doing. And, and that's, of course, natural gas. So let's get into something productive and talk a little bit about geothermal HVAC systems. I'm, I feel very fortunate that um, we've got uh, Shira. Did I say it right? Shira's filming this, so we'll get to. Um, I ha have a lot of multi hour and full day classes online for credit for architects and engineers through the International Ground Source Heat Pump Association. But this is going to be cool because it's more of the meat and potatoes of what we're going to talk about. And I'm going to send Shira some of the, uh, the slide deck so she can run along with, uh, so it can run along with this presentation. So I would venture to guess, but I have to get a show of hands. How many in here feel, are, are fairly, feel reasonably schooled in geothermal HVAC systems, right, show of hands? At least 60, if not 70%. So what I hope is that 60 or 70%, you'll pick up something new. And the others, I hope that all of these things will understand the, the verbiage, will identify the importance and adaptability and benefits of geothermal technology as not just important but vital to infrastructure and building construction. And there's a lot more reasons for that than just the greenhouse gas emissions and we'll talk about that. Um, I would argue that the technology is important to health human safety and imperative to industry goals. Um, so we have a capability as designers, architects, engineers, we have a capability and a responsibility to make these changes. And I love the, uh, the people that we're rubbing shoulders with here, like Brian and Peter and everybody else in here, that, and Tony over here. I, Tony's name was dropped in the meeting uh, with, uh, with uh, Cornell. He's highly respected and probably is uh, like I'm hiring. It's funny about NYSERDA, they, they keep hiring me through other consultants, but they keep yelling at me too because I keep getting in trouble. So, uh, but I don't care. I mean, I, I love, I love NYSERDA because they're, they do a lot more good than the trouble that sometimes comes up. And so does Cornell. Cornell's a crown jewel. Uh, we can get them um, in, going in the right direction with, with, uh, with everything that's going on. I would like to invite everybody here to leave with the intent to, un, uh, not only the intent, but understand that, and this is what I tell designers wherever I go, whether it's a room of 300 or it's 50 or it's, a, or it's a, an online webinar, um, I get to keynote a big energy conference next, uh, energy fair, I think it is, next month in uh, Rensselaer. Um, and, and so I, I love to help people to understand that there is not really a place where ground coupled air conditioning and heating cannot work. I have yet to find one, no matter where I've gone. So we want to leave with the intent to offer, specify, and apply the technology in every application going forward. I do mean that I have not seen one where it doesn't work. So this is just kind of a reiteration of this and we're going to get into geothermal systems in general. So like anything, I love it when people explain things from the basics, but we're gonna accelerate very quickly. Um, I love C.S. Lewis, he has great quotes, and this is kind of where we are as a, as, as a um, people, uh, whether you count it the people of Tompkins County, or New York, or, or the whole earth. Uh, C.S. Lewis said this, and it's a play on my name, so I specifically like this. It may be hard for an egg to turn into a bird. It would be a jolly sight harder for it to learn to fly while remaining an egg. We are all like eggs at, oh, we are all like eggs at present, and you cannot 
go on indefinitely being just an ordinarily an ordinary decent egg we must be hatched or go bad now that hatching process is painful that's mo any have you ever heard that you know if you help the bird out it might not get strong enough there's a lot of uh, of things that go into that so we have to make some hard choices and I think everybody in this room is committed to that let's go into this now so in every geothermal system of which I'm aware there are a few exceptions to this and we'll talk about them you have at least a ground loop exchanger of some sort and there are many kinds you have a heat pump which is usually a device that runs uh, on the Carnot refrigeration cycle and because it manipulates heat it compresses uh, heat to to help the thermodynamic process and then you have a distribution system the distribution system can be forced air or it can be radiant or a couple of other potential ways like in here we have a forced air system you can feel the air coming from the ceiling oftentimes a building will have a radiant floor there's radiant floor heating there's also radiant floor cooling I just wrote an article in commercial architecture about a big uh, big place in Toronto that has radiant floor cooling but more common there are radiant panels in the ceiling too the refrigeration cycle is important to understand for this uh, because I mentioned uh, by and large most geothermal heating and cooling systems use a heat pump this heat pump is indicated right here in this simplified diagram but every refrigeration cycle has a compressor a condenser an expansion valve and an evaporator and the reason for these particular parts I'm going to go back because I, I, I abbreviated this sometimes I have a better explanation is the compressor actually compresses a cool vapor to a hot high pressure vapor and that's how it manipulates the available heat in any system one of the questions we will get constantly is if it's 50 degrees in the ground how do we get that to a comfortable temperature in the middle of the winter it's through the Carnot refrigeration cycle and this compressor is the key to that uh, it compresses a low temperature low pressure vapor to a high temperature high pressure vapor and I'm just going to say it like this when you're dealing with with any vapor any gas the amount of energy in a cubic foot for example if it's compressed to one tenth the size the same energy is still going to be in there but that is manifest by a higher temperature and so that's how it's manipulated and then it's dropped it's condensed into a liquid and that's the latent heat a lot of latent uh, a lot of absorption happens during this process it's expanded this is kind of like a the, the, the way that if you have a hot garden hose outside with hot liquid in it and you spray it out it immediately begins to evaporate and cool the evaporator finishes the process this is the cooling coil typically the evaporator and the condenser is the heating coil and in a heat pump system it can reverse this one is in the process of doing cooling and uh, it's rejecting heat into the ground in the, in the winter time it would be doing heating because of the reversing capability of a heat pump I want to talk uh, just a minute about energy efficiency ratings and coefficient of performance. This gets a lot less dry in a little while, but this is important for the basis of this. Heat pumps and systems in general, any system is rated at, uh, with a COP, a coefficient of performance, and it's simply the BTUs de delivered divided by the BTUs consumed. This can also be, it doesn't matter, like units. KW delivered divided by KW consumed and that's how it's done now the US interestingly enough is the only one that tries to confuse the issue by using an energy efficiency rating heat pumps in the rest of the world are rated in COP both for heating and cooling you're familiar with that and so um, COP is super simple because if I tell you I have a heat pump with a COP of five that means for every unit of electricity it's using it's delivering five units of heat the equivalent of 5 kW so if it's using 1 kW of electricity and it's a 5 COP it's going to deliver 5 kW of heat um, a quick correlation 
a uh, couple of quick correlations. One watt of electricity equals 3.412 BTUs. BTU, just to get down to basics, is about is the same amount of energy it takes to raise one pound of water one degree Fahrenheit. It's also, just to give you a burn characteristic, it's the equivalent heat that's given off by burning one match, wooden match, from top to bottom. That's about one BTU. So uh, one watt of electricity is equal to about 3.4 matchsticks burned, or about 3.4 degrees of temperature increase in one pound of water. So there is a correlation here, EER equals COP times 3.412. It's a very confusing thing and so I don't mention it much more. So a, a, a unit that's a COP of 5 would also be an EER of 17. You can do the math here. But why do we do that? Because I, I want to, for those who have studied anything about this in school, EER is the cool, net cooling capacity div divided by the applied energy in watts. Why are we mixing units here? It's a very confusing characteristic and, and it's easier to just stay with COP because the general public understands COP very well. Uh, here's a great example, and I love this image because it is one of the best images for showing what a heat pump does. I take one unit of electricity from the grid, from the electric grid and with that I use a heat pump to pump four additional units of heat from the ground for a grand total of five units of heating in the building. That gives me a COP of five. Here is all of the all of the calculations that you need to understand that. Um, in air conditioning and heating one ton of air conditioning is 12,000 BTUs. Interestingly enough 12,000 BTUs, or the term ton, comes from how much cooling effect or heat can be absorbed by one ton of ice melting. Literally 2,000 pounds of ice melting is equivalent to one ton. That's where it came from. So a three ton uh, heat pump is rated at 36,000 BTUs. To, to do that 36,000 BTUs of heating, it only uses 7,200 equivalent BTUs of electricity or 2.1 kilowatts. So for 2.1 kilowatt, kilowatts, it delivers a constant 10.5 kilowatts of energy. There, any way you look at it, that's how you get your 5.0 COP or your 17 EER for cooling. Like I said, I'm kind of staying away from this. The interesting thing to note here is for 2.1 kilowatt hours, you get 10.5 kilowatt hours, which is the equivalent net free energy, just as if you were using a photovoltaic panel, you're getting 8,440 8, watts of energy each hour it runs that's coming from the ground. And what exactly is that energy? And, and by the way, I, I should point out that in the cooling mode, you're just taking, the, the home becomes the solar thermal collector, and it operates a little bit like a refrigerator in your kitchen. You've got a, a box in your kitchen and it's constantly pumping the heat out of the box. In the, in the case of a geothermal heat pump, it's constantly pumping the heat back into the cooler earth. Now, just, did I hear somebody? Or, okay. Just to give a, an example of, of what you will see when you look at an equipment chart of different and various air conditioners and heaters, this can be very confusing because you're looking over here, okay, I've got a, a a system size or cooling power of 30,000 BTUs. It says 8.8 .8 kilowatts. It says it's 2.5 tons. What does all this mean? Well, I just talked about tons. That's 12,000 BTUs. If you divide 12,000 into 30,000, that's 2.5. So it's a 2.5 ton unit. It says, as it, let's pass by this. It says it has a COP of 3.1 input power. Now think about what we just learned. The input power is 2.8 kilowatts. For 2.8 kilowatts, I get 8.8 .8 kilowatts of delivered energy movement. And that's what that means. If you divide 8.8 .8 by 2.8, you get 3.1. That's how it happens. So it doesn't matter. You go down here to this 11.3 uh, this, um, or this 20 uh, ton uh, unit here. It doesn't matter. You, you're, I don't know why it's got a couple of different things. 
here. Let's look at this 63 ton unit. It uses 84.7 84 kilowatts to deliver 223 kilowatts or 760,000 BTUs of energy at a COP of 2.6. This is nothing, this is not necessarily geothermal, but it just shows a little bit about what's going on in these charts. This chart over here has a little bit more about the efficiency of air cooled versus geothermal when you start looking at your geothermal heat pumps. And unfortunately, People in the U.S. still love to rate them in EER, so it's a necessary evil. But look at how efficient some of them get. 44, 32, 33 uh, integrated EER, 34, 22 uh, for the, st the steady state EER, compared to the air source constant speed units that are about a third of that. So um, that's how we understand a little bit about the efficiency of geothermal. Uh, air conditioning and heating systems in general. I have a question back here. Go ahead. Uh, it's, I'm, I'm just interested in the energy return on the energy invested. It sounds like for day-to-day -day operation, it would be like one to five. Yes. But when you include the installation, um, what does the energy return look like? I will. I promise I will get into that. That is an advanced question, and it will, I will get into that before we get in. Before we get to the end, and 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 I will answer any further questions that it doesn't answer after that. But I can tell you there is an economy of volume in it. The smaller the system, the longer it takes to pay back. In other words, the one-off systems like residential are a little longer. The bigger the system, the faster the payback. Sometimes it's um, it's immediate. Uh, the economy of volume on geothermal systems is such that um, there are systems, I'm, I'm involved in large uh, chiller energy plants where the, the payback is immediate the day, the day you put it in. Um, but, and then there are also residential applications where it may take 10 years because, because of the work outside such as you see right here. So it's a good question. So. Let's get a little further into it and we'll talk about that. Thank you. Okay, so this is a typical vertical installation. Probably most of us have seen a geothermal drill rig and this is typically what they look like. It's a, it looks like a water well drill, drill rig. When we're doing a vertical system, they're called boreholes. They're not wells, they're boreholes because into the borehole, and you'll see a picture of this a little bit later on, there is a pair of pipes that are closed loop. Then the pipes, and you can see pairs of pipes coming out through this header trench, going different ways, uh, are all tied in and brought back into a building where they go to a geothermal heat pump. And this is a typical geothermal heat pump. This happens to be a three-story house. Well, it's basement and two stories on a very tight plot. And they were going, this particular homeowner was going for net zero energy. And it's important to, note it, to notice, I'm going to tell the story of this. I wrote this one up in National Geographic a few years ago because this happened to be the sustainability direct for, director for the Department of Navy in Washington, D.C. So you can Google this uh, and, and, and see it in the, uh, in, in the National Geographic uh, energy features. But this gentleman wanted to put enough solar panels on his house to power um, his air conditioning and heating. He found that he couldn't get enough uh, solar capacity on that little roof without going to a geothermal heating and cooling system. And then he could because it, was, it reduced the, the consumption or the peak consumption of his electricity. Now, the, the way to do a system is uh, you want a tight building first, then you apply some, you, you've got to eliminate greenhouse gas emissions, in other words, use an all electric appliance such as a geothermal heat pump, and then you can add the solar uh, generation if you want to go net zero, because it's going to be easier to do once you have reduced the energy consumption to the greatest extent possible. So in this particular gentleman's case, he was able to go net zero energy and net zero emissions. Not only tier one, but tier two. 
he was able, because he has an electric car that he uh, plugs in here, so he was able to get his transportation down. And that was kind of his experiment, experiment to get it down to net zero energy, net zero emissions. That was his number one thing. And as a matter of fact, more and more cities, that's where New York is focused on getting emissions down 50% uh, by 2030. And is it 30% by 50? It's 2000, help, somebody help me here. It's 80% by 2050. What is it by 2030? Anybody remember? 40%, I think. 40%. That's what it is. So the only way to get greenhouse gas emissions down is to stop combustion heating in buildings. That's where the greenhouse gas emissions are primarily coming from. Certainly they're working on it in cars, but buildings are, they can't get there without buildings. And that's for another presentation but there are graphs that show how much we, we are uh, emitting from our buildings. So let's get in a little bit into geothermal system design overview. There are a lot of variations for earth loop systems. And here are just a few just illustrated. This is the vertical closed loop we were talking about. This is surface water. This is a very, uh, this is something that we're going to talk a lot about in the case studies right toward the end. The surface water geothermal exchange. There's also horizontal uh, loop systems and there is something, there, there are several variations of open loop systems. Supply and reinjection, standing column well, similar to St. Patrick's Cathedral in Manhattan. There are a lot of standing column wells and open systems in the Northeast here. Just, and there are a lot of exchange systems that exchange heat with pools and ponds and other things. This is the well filled for the Cornell uh, Bloomberg Center on Roosevelt Island. We'll talk more about that in one of the case studies. Here are the benefits of going geothermal. Now this is important. Um, I just had a I'm doing a, I'm a consultant for several different entities. One of the entities I'm working for, the only reason they want to go geothermal is to eliminate outside equipment. Why? Because it's a, it's a worldwide church that has about $10 million worth of condensers stolen each year worldwide. Now condensers are the units outside. Elimination of outdoor equipment does so many things. It eliminates the outdoor noise. It, if you were in the, um, the um, Kaufman incubator this morning, they have distributed geothermal heat pumps, which means they have a geothermal heat pump in each and every room of, the, of that beautiful building. And they're so quiet. They're, whatever air noise you hear now was actually more noise than I heard in that building. The, the heat pumps are completely, they have compressors in them and everything, but distributed heat pump systems are magnificent, super efficient and super quiet. So you eliminate outdoor equipment, you have superior comfort. Why would I say superior comfort in heating and cooling modes? The heating is constant and even. It's not like too hot like furnace heating where, where it dries it out. It actually helps to retain humidity in the wintertime heating because it's a more a more even and constant heat. Now in the summertime, what happens with DX, direct expansion equipment, especially split systems, if you're fighting against a 90 degree outdoor air temperature, what happens is the evaporator temperature or the indoor coil temperature goes up, you remove less humidity. So in standard systems, the cooling becomes more humid, where in geothermal systems, I hear this over and over again, the humidity removal and the constancy of the cool temperature, cool air temperatures is premium. And it really is because you're dealing with a cooler heat sink, the, the earth itself, which in this area is 55 degrees. You're rejecting the heat down to the, into the earth. So it's operating in the middle of summer as efficiently as if it were 55 degrees outside. So it's going to operate very effectively. The same thing has to do with the winter. A heat pump can, can grab an incredible amount of heat out of 55 degrees. Modern heat pumps can operate very effectively well below freezing. So a 55 degree earth temperature is magnificent for a heat source for a, a geothermal heat, heat pump system. Enabling 
Okay, so this is the big thing for New York uh, and everywhere. Elimination of fossil fuel consumption on site. This is, this is very, this is the whole focus of why we're here. We need to eliminate on site fossil, fossil fuel consumption. If we go all electric in our buildings, the grid is green and getting greener. I have some more slides about that. And we can, the grid will take care of itself. Trust me, trust the grid. I mean, New York is adding an incredible amount of windmills out in the Atlantic. We've got solar going in, which is feeding the grid. They will figure out how to do it. By the way, I'm not even gonna just go into that. We're just gonna leave that where it is. This enabling of thermal load sharing for pool and water heating is that's just at a local level it's a very big deal it's called uh, thermal grids uh, we use that terminology a lot I'm on a project uh, in Manhattan with Con Ed valued at 10 million dollars where they are trying to off load excess heat from skyscrapers to the residential buildings that's a thermal grid. So here you have a skyscraper in the middle of a snowstorm in January. The cooling towers are, and if you have never been down and seen a, a, a commercial building, especially it's almost hysterical to look at, but the snow flurries are coming down and the cooling tower is blowing steam off because the buildings are cooling dominant even in the middle of the winter because they're filled with people and computers. Meanwhile, you have the people in the tenements down uh, that, that are paying three and four hundred dollars a month for their electricity or their gas because they need the heat. This is part of the essence of sustainability and this is part of when we get into a geothermal type of system or water source systems, you can move the BTUs hydronically to places that need them. And this is something that we've been working on with New York City and indeed um, many, many other jurisdictions worldwide uh, for years now, and, and Con Ed has a problem in Manhattan. They can't get any more natural gas downtown. They have to find a way to get people on electric, and these people don't, uh, uh, they, you know, they sell the natural gas and they don't have enough capacity, but they have enough electrical capacity, so they're, they're, they have a Con Ed gas solutions program. And if you just Google it, you'll see. So there's some fantastic stuff we're doing. It's confidential, but we have some skyscrapers going all geothermal in the city. And it's, it's coming along, it's coming along. Uh, you know, the, the great, uh, the, in there at the end of the, the, the slide presentation, but we've all heard of the Bloomberg Center, the Cornell Bloomberg Center, it's all geothermal. And we've heard of St. Patrick's Cathedral. There's a lot more going on. So this longevity of the system, um, with nothing outside, these inside heat pumps last an average of 25 to 35 years because they're all inside. They're operating very effectively in a conditioned environment. The storm proofing is very important. If you think about um, Texas and Sandy in 2012 here in New York, um, outside equipment uh, can be damaged by not only uh, storms but rising water in um, in um, Texas, uh, it's interesting. Most geothermal heat pumps are elevated into an attic space, or at least elevated in an equipment room. And you'll see, and you can kind of see this here. This is on an elevated shelf. Most air handlers are um, well above floodplain. So usually the condensers are sitting on the ground outside, and they're toast if they get flooded. And plus, they're outside. Uh, storm proofing, even the New York Times, you could Google this, New York Times, and I, I have the headline memorized, geothermal systems arise as a storm proof resource in the wake of Sandy. Uh, the bottom line is all of the geothermal systems in the city and surrounding areas survived the storm because there was nothing outside to damage. Those that you know, had cooling towers and fuel tanks did not survive, uh, at least for the most part. And this is another health and human safety issue here, the elimination of fresh water consumption usually from cooling towers. Fresh water isn't as much a premium here, but cooling towers do um, breed Legionella, which has been a big, big deal in a lot of places lately. We have a, a, um, a health and human safety thing. I'm on the uh, 2021 Uniform Mechanical Code Committee. We're writing the code internationally for for 2021 and one of the things is 
super strict and kind of like New York is doing even stronger super strict regulations on cooling towers and I would argue why not I mean in any case where you have geothermal you don't need cooling towers or boilers so it, it solves a lot of problems so let's talk about what a geothermal heat pump really is doing so what energy source is feeding your geothermal heat pump there's kind of a hint here the sun comes down, right? The sun comes down, and this is a NASA chart. 50% of the energy that strikes the Earth is absorbed by surface water and land. It's absorbed and retained. That makes Earth, wait for it, the world's largest solar collector, right? 50% of the sun's energy is absorbed. So in the Earth, this is a, an actual um, kind of sine wave of the difference in temperature at varying depths. At a half foot, uh, if you have a mean temperature of 55, you're going to go all the way up to 72 and all the way down to 34 if you're at a half foot. But if you're clear down at 12 feet deep, it gets really, it's only about a five degree variation from this 57 down to 48. So um, vertical ground loops are generally bored, you know, several hundred feet deep. So they really tap into this earth. And this is, this is the solar inputs into the earth's system. And it's, there are some other inputs here, which we won't go into. Um, solar is the dominant, uh, dominant uh, source of energy, obviously, on the earth. That makes the earth the world also, not, not only the world's largest solar collector, but it is the largest solar energy battery. It stores up this energy. So, and this is just one more, just one more technical slide. This is an actual chart that I got from a European Heat Pump Association or European Geological Association. It's right here uh, if you, uh, and I am going to share this slide presentation and I'm sure Brian will get it to those, those who want it. But the solar inputs down to 45 feet are 100%. You can't even sense any of the radioactive decay of the Earth. When you get down to about 100 feet, you start to be able to sense a little bit of the radioactive decay coming up. But until you get to 1,000 feet deep, it's, not, it's bare, almost not measurable. It gets really steady down here at about 45 feet. Uh, yeah, you don't have much variation from 27 to 45 feet. This is solid solar energy down to, down to about 45 feet. After that, it's going to stay or start getting warmer after a certain point. So here's the math I talked about. Yeah, even at 1,000 feet, there is a ratio of 1,814 to 1 in favor of solar energy being the dominant influence. And that's counting the entire 1,000 feet. So, uh, little math there on that hyperlink. So, we harvest, what we're really putting in here, we call it a geothermal heat pump, but really it's a solar energy heat pump. What it's doing is taking solar energy that's stored in the earth, and it's pumping it into the house for us to use for heating, not only our, our homes, but our domestic hot water and anything else we want. These, these processes can be used to do a lot more than just heating and cooling of buildings. It can be used for process heating, process cooling, and so forth. And these are all the different ways that uh, indicated that we can do that. Now, remember when I talked about the cubic foot of, of air in front of me, if you compress it down to one-tenth the size? This is kind of a graphic representation or a pictorial. Here, are these, here is this volume of, of gas and it's at a low temperature and when you compress it it's still the same gas it's just at a high pressure and high temperature this is because of uh, in thermodynamics heat only moves from a warmer temperature to a cooler temperature so if we want to manipulate the heat available in the ground at 55 degrees we just have to compress it and that's what our heat pump is doing it's actually pumping the heat up to a warmer temperature but it's only using one kilowatt of energy to, to, to actually deliver five kilowatts of heat. And that's what uh, this heat pump does uh, right here. And it can do it whatever way we decide we want to deliver that. And by the way, um, 
the delivery temperature here can be 90 degrees or it can be 190 degrees and we'll talk a little bit more about that. It, it does affect efficiency the higher you go in temperature but it's still a lot better than gas or direct uh, or, or, or straight electric heating. So some of the areas that we can use loop systems, this is a great graphic representation, I mean pictorial representation. We can use waterways such as this, such as even oceans. We can use building piles. They're doubling. Uh, there are many, many projects, including the Google campus out, uh, the new Google campus out in uh, Northern California, all built on building piles. Google says, we don't do anything that doesn't have at least two purposes. And that's the essence of sustainability. And it's looking that way with some of the things we're talking about, not only with uh, subways, but did you know that 300, I'm going to throw a number out here, three, according to the Department of Energy, 350 billion kilowatt hours uh, a year of energy we paid to heat goes down the sewer every day, I mean every year. That is enough energy to heat 5 billion homes for a day. And we pay to heat that and then we run it down the sewer. Thankfully, this is something uh, that has become square in the middle of the ro radar and there are companies worldwide, uh, one in particular in Vancouver, Wastewater Energy Systems, is doing massive energy reclaim projects on wastewater worldwide. <coughs> Vancouver, I don't know, that's where it started, they have a downtown energy district that's completely heated with wastewater from, the, from their sanitary sewer. Not only that, but there are um, gray water applications. There, there, there's so many. We are just, we're just so used to cheap energy in this country and the fact that we can burn fossil fuels to make energy that we, have, we haven't really focused on all the opportunities to re-extract energy that are out there. It's absolutely phenomenal. So wastewater thermal energy recovery, and these are wastewater, these wastewater energy plants are going in all over the world, this company that I talked about in Vancouver, five years ago, I happened to stop by at the International Air Conditioning Show, and they were a little 10 by 10 booth. And I, I want, I better not say five, it was probably more like 10 years ago. Bottom line is, they're on the stock exchange now. They're a massive company now. They're doing plants worldwide as fast as they can get uh, as fast as they can answer the calls. So if you ever get a chance, look into that. There are so many things to talk about. I'm used to doing this in seven hours, and I usually have a few slides on wastewater energy. You wouldn't believe what's happening with this, the amount of heating they're doing with it. Not only that, in New York, they have skyscrapers that have gone have been installed on energy piles. These are called energy piles. They got to put them in the ground anyway. They just put exchangers in them. and. They don't need outside equipment anymore. They don't need boilers if it's done properly. So this is kind of what I was talking about with the cooling dominant buildings. These buildings, now it looks like a, a rosy summer or spring picture here, but imagine this is winter time and these buildings are still having, they still have excess heat that they're pumping out and it's snowing outside. This is what a thermal energy grid interconnectivity pipeline looks like because the energy that's instead of going out the cooling towers on the roof is forced down into this grid is then extracted from this grid by these apartments that need the heat. So they're taking an incredible millions of BTUs and putting them into this thermal energy grid that can then be used by um, by apartments, uh, by swimming pools, public, you know, uh, you know, recreational swimming pools, by anything, by residential homes, anybody that needs this process heat. Certainly there is always an imbalance. I mean, in a perfect world, everything balances out, right? But that's not our world. So there is an excess either of BTUs going out or BTUs that we need. So we, uh, in a thermal energy grid, we have some type of, of, of thermal energy sink or thermal energy source. And we'll talk a little bit more about waterways and, and, and loops and so forth for that. This is the, one of the most brilliant examples to simplify thermal advantage load sharing that I've ever seen. 
at the Indianapolis Zoo, they had two new exhibits going in. And these two new exhibits, one was a polar bear exhibit and the other was an African elephant exhibit. They wanted to go geothermal, so they put in a common loop field, and that's indicated by this right here. Now, these are, and we'll get a little bit into this, water to water heat pumps. This is, you have a water to air heat pump. If you have forced air, that means it's water source. It's using a hydronic source, the geothermal loop, and it's pumping air out. That's the delivered uh, energy. But also water to water heat pumps are very popular for radiant in floor heating, radiant cooling, and for things like swimming pools and polar bear exhibits. Now these heat pumps can either heat or cool. So they need this polar bear exhibit at 40 degrees. So what happens on a normal day like today, that water is absorbing BTUs. We talked about the sun just constantly heating up, especially during the summertime. So this heat pump is constantly pumping BTUs out of the polar bear exhibit and into the ground loop. Well, this common ground loop, which is kind of like a thermal energy grid, is having to pump BTUs out of the ground and out of the ground loop into the radiant in-floor system to keep it at 100 degrees to keep these African elephants co um, comfortable. This is essentially a dynamic, seemingly perpetual use uh, and reuse of thermal loads. You take what was a 5.0 COP uh, heat pump and because it's sharing energy with other heat pumps on the system, it can go up to 7, 8, 10, 11 COP when you're sharing energy like that. It's not even, the ground doesn't even have to do anything part of the time. It's just going, energy from one is being exchanged with the other. This is, this is rejecting heat, this is absorbing heat, so it's pulling the heat right up into there. So it's a very effective way to do it. So there are a couple or three different types. We talked, I've been talking about water to water and water to air systems. There are also two major types of, of, deliveries, uh, of delivery systems. I've talked about distributed heat pumps. This is a geothermal heat pump, more of a residential size. This is a more of a commercial size geothermal heat pump. It might be a 10 or 15 ton. That would be, if this was a geothermal building, you'd probably have uh, probably a 10 ton doing these two rooms right here. So you'd have something like this either above the ceiling or in a mechanical room. Now when you get into a college campus or a downtown building, you have a chill, what's called a chiller energy plant. This is a chiller, a centrifugal chiller. That can be geothermal source too. As a matter of fact, many, many are. And this is when I talked about the economy of volume. These bad boys really, um, really work well on geothermal uh, sourced systems. So this is kind of what it looks like in an engineering diagram. Here are three 700 ton centrifugal chillers and they're being sourced by geothermal wells. Or you can have a bunch of individual heat pumps that are doing different and various heating and cooling loads. And much like the polar bear and elephant exhibit, some of the heat pumps are doing heating, some of them are doing cooling, so some of them are pulling energy from the condenser water loop and some of them are rejecting energy. So there, what happens is, remember this term, thermal advantage load sharing. Um, Stanford, on their campus, when they went off CHP, and started sharing, I, this is a, again a whole, other, um, a whole other presentation, but when they started sharing energy between the buildings on their campus, there's a bandwidth where the energy is shared that it was the equivalent of 80% of the time they could balance the load between buildings. The only excess was during the peak of the summer and the peak of the winter and was only about 20% of the year. So in other words, what this meant in your larger applications is they only had to put in a loop field, a geothermal source that was rated for 20% of the entire capacity of the campus because they're doing thermal load sharing. What happens is, and we, um, I, I've been involved with the Empire State Plaza on a project and we did the bin data there and 
it's amazing how much energy they can share between all of the different processes and all of the different buildings they have on this. It's a very large 10,000 ton campus. They've got the four skyscrapers and all these libraries and, and, and different um, museums around. And it's a, a massive complex that can share an incredible amount of energy. So it was a wonderful presentation we got to do uh, over there earlier this year. And uh, as a matter of fact, it, is, uh, it actually stopped the CHP plant that should be in already there because they're really giving geothermal a solid look now. So it's amazing what a little bit of knowledge can do. So if you don't know what CHP means, that means combined heat and power. What essentially that means is they're burning natural gas to make electricity and the electricity is feeding different various parts and pieces and they're grabbing the waste heat off of the, um, off of the exhaust and, and, and that's making more hot water. The fact of the matter is CHP is probably the best use of natural gas if you have to use it, but the better use is to use the grid because the grid is green and getting greener and we're going to talk a little really? bit more. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I hit a I hit a bane there, didn't I? No, I know. You should. Now, I I have to tell you, um, I'm going to tell you a funny story, but it's factual, so I'm not afraid of it being published. We've got some too. Oh, I bet you do. So, I was uh, at the beginning of my NYSERDA tour in September, right around this time last year. Um, I was going from one place to another. It's kind of like today. This is my third venue today. And I was doing a lot of things and, and, and um, I had published an article in Renewable Energy World about the Empire State Plaza and it had gotten the attention of the mayor of Albany so she, I, I was invited to sit with her and talk to her and a bunch of New York Power guys were there. and. I'm trying to recall exactly how this this happened, but the bottom line was they really didn't realize how much energy was being wasted and just going up the stacks from natural gas. They use a high a high energy steam driven chiller system. In other words, they they are currently using natural gas boilers to make high energy steam to drive turbines that turn their chillers instead of electric chillers. So fortunately I think that's on the road to recovery. But um, the amount of, of uh, emissions from that is incredible. So the improvement was to go to a CHP combined heat and power plant where they, where they are, are doing a little bit better. But the argument is that they are already tied in to the uh, Hudson River there that goes through town, or the, the river, I think it's the Hudson that goes through town there, yeah. And they're already using that as a heat sink. That's where they're dumping all of the heat for the, um, from the, uh, from the co condensers for the steam and from the waste heat from the plaza. And that would solve a lot of problems because they're already using that. They could use that as a thermal heat source and a th thermal heat sink. I know, right? That's what we keep hearing, but you just keep towing the line because it works and we've been doing it. All. We're going to talk about some case studies where it is being done and uh, we'll do that a little bit more toward the end, I promise. So the basic components, this is a little reminder before we move on. We have pumps, condenser water piping. If it's condenser water piping, that means generally it's um, the heat exchanger is common to condenser water piping. We have the heat pump. We have the specialties oftentimes such as an air separator, an expansion tank, and service ports. These are some of the terminologies you'll hear as we talk about geothermal heat pumps. This is a basic garden variety geothermal heat pump. Just so you realize, you have a fan. Uh, this is a water to air heat pump, by the way. There are water to water, which I have a, a description of coming up soon. But you have a fan, you have a, a coil here that transfers heat with the air stream. This is either the heating coil in the heating mode or the cooling coil in the cooling mode. And the fan draws air through it and it goes up into a duct system. Down here is the compressor, the coaxial refrigerant to water exchangers, and the controls. Now you'll notice there are five connections on here. 
Two of the connections are for the ground loop. Two of the connections are for the domestic hot water generator to give you free hot water. Uh, and then the last one is a condensate drain for in the summertime mode when you're removing humidity, you have to have some more for the condensate to go. So component quality is important. This is more of an engineering slide, but I wanted to uh, just give a, a quick rundown of the components. I talked about the domestic hot water generator. This is, you know, you can actually see the circulator that in, in most heat pumps. This is an option, by the way. It's usually a couple hundred dollars on a heat pump to get a domestic hot water generator. What it does is it takes the waste heat that the compressor is creating anyway, much of the air, and it just pumps all of that heat in the form of domestic hot water into the water tank. And even in the, even in the winter time, it will take the first couple or three percent of superheat, they call off the compressor, and put it into the tank. And yes, that costs you, but it's pennies on the dollar compared to what it would cost to heat with gas or electric. So that's how it's tied in. A lot of people use, won't go too much into this, an unpowered buffer tank just to store the hot, just to store water from the domestic hot water generator to supply a second powered tank, either electrically or a gas heated power tank. Okay, so here's where we get to look at our different types of geothermal heat pumps. This is just like that right there. That's their vertical water to air heat pump right there. Um, you can usually tell them because, tell, because they're, they have a, a kind of a squat lower section that has the compressor. You can see the panel. And then the upper section is the fan and coil for the forced air. Now I'll just jump right over here. This is a water to water heat pump. This is a dedicated domestic hot water geothermal heat pump. This is a 90,000 BTU heat pump that can make 5, 000, 5 gallons per minute of hot water at 140 degrees uh, continually. Uh, it's got a tank here just to regulate the temperature, but this is in a house. This is at a larger house, granted. Most people don't have to have a dedicated domestic hot water heat pump. Most of them can get their um, hot water just from the, the waste heat, but this, this gentleman decided to do it. Many restaurants and uh, commercial buildings have dedicated domestic hot water heat pumps, but this could also be used to do uh, radiant cooling or radiant heating in a building. Another type of water to water heat pump is a pool heat pump. This is a titanium exchanger dead, uh, pool heat pump and it exchanges water from a ground loop uh, through a titanium exchanger and through and using a uh, standard Carnot refrigeration cycle to the pool water, the chlorine water in a pool. So in a, in a given home, aquatic center, Marriott hotel or anything, you'll probably see these three different types of heat pumps. They're all geothermal source and the one thing that is common to all of them, here it is right here, is they can all be tied to a common condenser water loop. So some, like the dedicated domestic hot water heat pump, are pulling heat from the loop because they're making heat for the hot water tank, while those that are cooling the building are rejecting heat to the loop. And if you think about it, it's, you can't do this with air source heat pump equipment, and certainly you can't do it uh, when you're when you're burning fossil fuels, what a waste of what a waste of resources. When you're doing a water source heat pump, you can share these BTUs, and that is the essence of sustainability. So, when we when we're talking about these, these can live in harmony on a condenser water loop in a building. Now, the two types. Now, we we talked a lot about forced air. If this building were all radiant cooled and heated, it would have radiant in the radiant lines in the floor like this and would provide all the heating you needed for, for the building. And then it would have radiant, these are called chilled beams. That's just a, uh, uh, that is, I, I don't know why we give things the names we do. I guess you could say this looks like a beam. This is just a, this is, this is radiant cooling. What actually happens? How many by a show of hands have been in a building with radiant cooling? Anybody? Couple? Oh my goodness. Dead silent, NC levels of 20, you can't hear a thing, it's so, it's so wonderful. 
These are actually from the Cornell Bloomberg Center on Roosevelt Island. Oh, what a comfortable environment they are. So comfortable. Now, you may be wondering, you have to have fresh air. Well, if you look here, they have a dedicated fresh air unit uh, providing about one-tenth the forest air normally. So this is what's called an active chilled beam. You see a few little, you see the center vent and some of the, some of the fresh air comes through that but these louvers on the side are the radiant and it just, you just ever felt like just this, it's just a cool blanket. It's just like constantly, uh, oh, it's amazing. I actually, the first time I enjoyed uh, radiant cooling was in a, it was in a dentist's home uh, that was geothermal back in 1992. Some brilliant engineer had designed, custom designed a radiant cooling system for his, for his home. It was amazing. So it's not something new, but it's definitely been developed. What it is now is instead of grills, they, would, they actually have ceiling tiles with pecs on the back and the radiant panels. They can be retrofitted. Uh, there is a trick to it, lest anybody um, fool you. These things have to be controlled with, they call it injection mix, mixing blocks, so that the panels stay above the dew point. They know the dew point, they have to stay above the dew point, and you have to have the 100% fresh air system in a building because it's got to control the humidity and give, bring you fresh air. So these things all work in unison. As a matter of fact, it's, it's almost an exact science, but when I toured this building to... Um, I wrote an article, I write for a lot of magazines. I write, men, uh, it was mentioned that I, I do a little bit of writing and I love that. I just recently reviewed that article on net zero emissions versus net zero energy because somebody was asking me about it. My point is I get to write, every time I get a wild crazy idea, I write an article about it. But um, I got to write and I'll pass it around. This is uh, from January on Cornell's campus and I got to talk to the building engineer and got to do all kinds of fun stuff there and I've been there a couple of times since. I got my survey in there because, you know, they have to see how good this can work. Uh, so the bottom line is, I was talking to the engineer and he goes, I said, so, how's it work for you? He said, all except for the first week, fine. He said, I said, what happened the first week? He said, it was raining in here. They didn't have it under control, so these things were condensing, so they got it under control. It's a control issue. and so. Anybody can Google this. This is all online. It's Cornell's Tech Campus aims for net zero. It was a fun article. Ah, oh, it was so much fun. I, I do probably three or four articles a year for uh, commercial uh, architecture. I very much like. Uh, How does it work on the floor? Okay, so on the floor you're just providing heat. So what it does is you run warm water through the floor and it's called radiant in floor heating and uh, it's actually mentioned in the article uh, they have radiant in and the interesting thing is the only place they need the radiant in the floor is on the bottom floor they have a, a, because after that they're between conditioned spaces so you don't really need it after that yes sir was the building in the article that you shared uh, extraordinarily more expensive than the study? no yeah, no. Uh, I hope that I hope that I put in here. Um, I'm I'm the lead consultant worldwide for Disney on geothermal, and I just picked up the other theme park in um, in uh, in Orlando, and they're doing a 2,000 room hotel, and the two the the uh, 3,300 ton chiller energy plant we're putting in pays back in about two months. It's absolutely extraordinary. The economy of volume is out of this world. And here's why. Right now, it's unfair right now because the federal government gives um, what's called a 10% tax credit and then there's MACRs. So it puts, it's actually less than zero. It's paid back before they even go in because their energy plant for that place is $18 million. So they get $1.8 million the wells on the system are only about a million point two. Could private colleges do that? Uh, they can do it. They, there are great little ventures where for-profits can do it for them and take advantage of that and turn it over. However, I've seen so many of those happen. I haven't been involved in one personally, but I've heard uh, many, many nonprofits take advantage of that. They just create 
a joint venture with some for-profit entity, maybe it's the engineering company or the installation company that does it, they take the tax credit and pass it along however they wish to the college. It is awfully simple. If you, if you have a, if there is a will, there is a way. And I'm going to show, you're going to see the slides of the payback on larger systems. It is amazing. And then if you get into water, uh, surface water systems, it's even better. So it's remarkable. Uh, so such a fast payback. Yes, sir. So let's say it, you have a uh, district heating system mm -hmm. that's running off of a CHP. Mm -hmm. And let's say you know the turbines have a life 10 to 12 years, and you're approaching the end of that time. What would it look like to convert that plant to geothermal and have some of those big bad boys that you put? It would be so simple. Um, when I say so simple, I don't want to oversimplify it. If they're doing, if the, the, the campus that we're talking about has a distributed steam pipe system, that's a lot warmer than distributed hot water. But here's the trick, and this is where you have to get into the weeds. That steam is going through exchangers at the individual buildings, and it's exchanging with a condenser water loop a heated water loop that's actually delivering water at between 170 and 190 degrees probably. And if you can't deliver that, I sat in, well, let's just say, let me just say this, retrofitting, chain, adjusting the existing heating coils in the fan coils in the building is extremely easy. And that isn't me talking, that's engineers that have done it at Ball State who have sat in front of New York, y yes, they retrofitted that whole campus to geothermal and it was high energy steam before, very hot. Now, there's even something better when we get to it. Dram in Norway had a district system that did all of the downtown buildings, 250 commercial buildings plus 60,000 residents, all hot, but they were using 180 degree um, hot water from natural gas fired boilers they were able to get a chiller energy plant using the um, river water, which is at 40 degrees. It produces 195 degree water at a COP of 3.1. So there are some, when you get into high end, and this is called, the, the company is called Star Refrigeration. I'm, uh, I have him tasked at looking at some other projects here in New York because he has some amazing chiller energy uh, factors. And you'll see that here and you'll be able to, you can Google it, you can look on, yes sir? We need to keep going. Yes, yes we do, don't we? Where are we, where are we, we're, we're supposed to be done at 6.30? Yeah. Holy, yeah. how does this happen? Yeah, I know, well, I, I know that people, some people are, were really are interested and probably would want to stay and talk. Yeah. Uh, you know, I don't want to, you know, overcommit people People's time. Yeah, you're, you're exactly right. I do this all the time and, and you know what? I promise I'm going to get to the end in the case studies. Uh, this is where I kick it a little bit. We've, cut, we've got a good foundation. I'm going to kick it a little bit into high gear and just remember um, you can always go on. My website is 100% informational. I don't try to sell anything. So you can go on my website which is just eggeo.com and there are a lot of case studies and you can ask me anything. I, uh, information is free. So here's a horizontal system, there's a vertical system. That's what they look like if they were above a ceiling. This is kind of a, a condenser water loop with several heat pumps on it and there's a plate and frame exchanger. So we've already kind of covered this about sharing energy between multiple, multiple systems in a building. And there's your, your swimming pool heaters. We've talked about those. And now we're going to evaluate the benefits of geothermal. Now we've already talked about all these. This is exactly the same thing we talked about before. Everything from eliminating outdoor equipment, fossil fuel consumption, to, eliminate, uh, to elimination of outdoor condensers. I love this quote. This is where we're at now. Whether it's talking about the local campus or whether it's talking about we all want progress, but if you're on the wrong road, progress means 
doing an about face, about turn, and walking back to the right road. In that case, the man who turns back soonest is the most progressive. It may be hard to believe, but New York is the furthest along in the entire United States on this. Uh, and thanks to Tompkins, and all of you guys, and you still are fighting the good fight. I've heard it. I've been through. I've been, and so we got a lot of work to do. We got a lot of work to do. But here comes some. This is fantastic. Uh, I don't have time to go through it, but this is a, uh, this is a potential. It's actually, you Google this and you'll get the whole report. This is how much during uh, different market penetrations we can reduce CO2 emissions the percentage just by going geothermal. Just by going geothermal. This is an Oak Ridge National Laboratories report. Um, this is a little bit about, yeah, you're right, 40% uh, by 2030, by 2030 and 80% by 2050. So these are the NYSERDA programs. This is part of what they're doing to spur the use of ground source heat pumps. They have the $1,500 per ton rebate, and there are huge benefits to GHS, GSHP customers. Uh, some of the different types. This is the crew that put it together. This is, I, I'm sorry I'm going through this so fast, but you'll get time. This is their policy framework. They, by the way, and I love this about NYSERDA. Nice this is why I really, really like them at their very best. They are not here to give rebates permanently. They're just trying to spur the technology to let it catch on because as I've told you, it does catch, it will catch on and it is catching on. There are no special rebates in Florida and it, I don't think I have the, uh, the, again, there isn't time for it, but if I showed you a map of the geothermal systems in Florida, you would be blown away. I've been doing it there for a long time, but they're, they're so piled on top of each other and they're large commercial buildings that you wouldn't even believe it. So this is um, what they're doing in uh, Whisper Valley, Texas. And this is kind of what NYSERDA is working on doing in neighborhoods here in, in New York. This is also Pinewood Forest in Atlanta. It's doing the same thing, uh, putting in infrastructure. As a matter of fact, we have, I can't get into this right now. This is part of my Ontario work. I want to, I need to say something before I talk about this slide because it's going to show some paybacks and so forth and internal rates of return. But I wanted to say about this. New York uh, at a school in Valley Stream, an elementary school, tied the 40,000 square foot school into the domestic potable water line. They did this with the blessing of the um, Public Service Commission, and they tested it for three years. The test has been, a, the, the results have come out. This has opened the way, and it probably will take a little while to catch on and do the first projects, for public buildings to tie into potable water mains as the geothermal source and sink. In other words, no loop fields. Now. I'm working on a large project that's using just the gray water lines. The fact of the matter is we have all of this fluid passing by buildings in neighborhoods. It's, whether it's potable water mains, fire mains, gray water, those are all potential heat sources and heat sinks. We have to think outside of the box. And that's what they did when they tied into the, uh, the potable water main in, in Valley Stream. And that is opening the way nationwide for um, other public buildings as well as maybe private to do it. So I just wanted to cover that because I think I'm going to, I don't think I have a slide for that. So this is simple payback in years without tax credits on this large project I was talking about. 4.8, life cycle payback, 1.9, point. This is without any tax credits. Internal rate of return, 39%, 35%, 26% for different and various, um, different and various ways of doing it. Parameters, okay, unbelievable. I mean, when you look at these, uh, 
these paybacks and these internal rates of return. This is a $1.2 million uh, geothermal project and the Here it is. This is the payback without incentives. I'm sorry this is so small. Without incentives, simple payback in years is 5.28 or 5.38 years. With incentives, it's 4.4 or 4.27 years. Um, and then actually we, the, the thing that we did was we underestimated the cost of the of the uh, central energy plant. And so once we upped it to what it actually cost, it actually came in uh, well below that. So the internal rate of return on both of these is 25, 23, 27%. And this is a very large project. Oh, here we go. Uh, 0.96 years, 1.87 years, 1.3 years, 2.29 years. I wish I had the time to go through all of these numbers but it just blows um, clients away when they see how fast the, the, the return is. And here's the thing, they have big cooling towers outside that go away completely. They can't even believe that. And um, Disney has actually uh, said that the square footage of the, uh, that they save of cooling tower footprint outside is worth the, worth the cost, that, the cost to do it because they can use that square footage for other more purposeful things. Summary of the geothermal concept, and I know we're at, almost at time. I want to get to a couple of, uh, a couple of uh, case studies. They're highly energy efficient. They eliminate cooling tower related freshwater consumption. They provide storm proofing. They clear up valuable roof space, and they have great longevity due to no cooling towers, and the geo wells are always permanent. And Bob Wyman from Google uh, coined this phrase, the only reasonable solution to heating without combustion. Now, let's get, I have so much I, I want to share, but I do, I do. I promised you some, uh, here, here's something for you. Um, this was actually run in 1957, the all-electric building campaign. That's probably to tell me I need to stop talking. Um, here's, this is the actual line that National Grid painted. This is their peak in electricity during the summer. This is their peak in the winter. If you don't know, National Grid is a natural gas and electricity supplier. This is where they estimate the, it would be with GHPs. I don't know if you know, but National Grid did a geothermal neighborhood as a pilot project. And this is what they, they estimate it will shave the summer peak and add to the winter doldrums so they level their grid and their electrical, uh, their electrical uh, distribution is then much more profitable to them. Okay. This is another slide that shows that from National Grid. And this is actually what happens in a building, compared, one compared to another, to the, to the actual loads. Okay, this is my hurricane slides. <laughs> this is St. Patrick's Cathedral. That's actually how it, how it looks. That's how big, how deep they went with the wells there. Yeah, this is that school, Valley Stream. This is the example of the test. They had to actually put the water into the sewer at first to make sure it was safe. Then they turned it back and they're running it back into the water main like this, like this. So it's, a, it's just an exchange. It's just borrowing water BTUs. And that's the actual exchange, exchanger plant for the, uh, for the school. This is right in Pike Block, uh, Pike Block in Syracuse uses a brine aquifer below and they, they pump water from the aquifer and back into the aquifer and do the downtown area. They're looking at doing the entire downtown district doing this because it's got such a big aquifer underneath. This is, the, this is an example of river and surface water geo in Nashville. They had a, a 3,900 ton, they still do have a 3,900 ton uh, chiller plant and they 
bored all the way over to this Hoover Quarry and they put in these lake plate exchangers into this chiller system using this header system and they have they eliminated their cooling towers and all of their natural gas I mean it's they're doing it all the time and think about the amount of surface water we have here this is an example of what they do constantly up in Ontario they, the best time for them to put the uh, lake plate exchangers for our exchange is in the winter time because they can walk right out there and cut it out plus that's the better time for their fisheries so below freezing temperatures are no problems for for geothermal heat pumps Kings Mill Hospital has been on lake plate exchangers in the UK for quite some time we talked about Cornell campus and Rancho so I mean I just have a ton of case studies here Rancho Los Alamitos and Long Beach here's the city of Drammen Norway this is the one I wanted to get to because they were able to attain a system COP of 3.05 194 degree water distributed throughout the entire city heat extraction from 40 degree river water heats 225 commercial buildings formerly on gas boilers it's a fantastic project the city of Stockholm Sweden has been on river water system for all of Stockholm since the 80s yeah, yeah. so wait so, so Jay some people have to leave they don't want to I the meeting. I got gotcha. you meeting to go to I and you know what I I have a drive to do yet tonight so this is me I my, this is my evangelical side I can't stop I'd go all night if you if you let me <laughs> but I'm ready for questions thank you anything it doesn't matter how tired I feel once I get into this it's hard to stop me and and that's it, it's even after uh, a seven or eight hour class I'm just what's next so I love it I love it I love this because it Make so folks sense. that want to talk to Jay, uh, you know, should come up and talk. We got some time for you to do that. Absolutely. I don't leave. Well, I mean, we can, but people are trying to leave. Why don't we leave and let people leave? Okay. Yes. All right. I'm sorry. That I don't want to cut No, no, no. I love it. I, I, you know what? I, I am sorry, too. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you ever so much. Uh, thank you. And I just want you to know that everything is possible with geothermal systems and we Why know that get it then? they will Why are they, so they will they we have to stand our ground and do and just be patient and be right yeah do you know what uh, as a young skull full of mush in 1992 i was interviewed on several network television stations in the tampa bay area and they said so jay where is this all going I said I see in five years this is a utility and it's available to everybody in the United States that's how naive I okay, was so let's take questions the quarter of and then uh, it will end the meeting and, and the, the further people can come up and talk to them after that thank you oh, thank, can I give you a card yeah. all right so okay let's start with the questions. YMCA I've done several YMCA's all right thank you <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you, Frank. Oh my goodness. I've done so many YMCA's geothermal in Florida. I didn't think there are a lot of them. All right. I'm ready for any, but thank you so much, everybody. Yes, ma'am. So how do we change Cornell's mind? What's the most effective way that the institution as big as Cornell, they want to build a dorm, but they don't, you know, they don't telling us it's not possible how do we change an institution like that? it's um it's not a dorm by the way it's a residential hall complex yeah yeah 2,000 students okay. 2,000 it's like students another campus. it's like another campus um yeah yes and I was just over there meeting with them and they said our CHP is going to to be powered by geothermal and I just listened and my point is it's kind of a little bit like Empire State Plaza they're already tied into Cayuga Lake 
I would like to see a study of using the, uh, a lake sourced uh, chiller energy plant. Yeah, because we have plenty of precedents. So my thinking is, you know, let's just keep working on this. I understand you did the study. Are you with, um, what is it called? With Cape Engineer? Yes. I got to read part of it. I haven't got, had a chance to read the whole thing. We've but not the emissions. Right. Project. Yeah. So I think that, um, you know, it's, it's hard. It's kind of one of those things like this. They explained to me that the whole new residential campus is going to be fan coils. Okay, so what are fan coils? That means they're using heated water and chilled water to do the heating and cooling. They just want to make it simple and run it off the CHP plant right now. So the cooling is off of the lake cooling, so that's, not, that's great. But the heating would be off the CHP plant. So the question is, how much would it cost to do a lake sourced chiller energy plant? See, chillers do, they have two sides to them. They make heat on one side and they make cool on the other. So it's just a big heat pump plant. So there's no doubt it can be done, but I do see their point only in that they want to see what's down in the ground, but it shouldn't stop any other forward progress, in my opinion, to, to get them further toward a fully renewable campus. Especially since they're using frack gas, yeah. methane and leverage, the next 20 years of warming is critical. It just amazes me that that's a conclusion that they could come to yeah. uh, just because they want to build a case for being able to go deep to the and, you know, if that's indeed the case, if that's the only reason, you know, I, I don't know. It's, it seems to me like a classic example of the tail wagging the dog. Yes. Mm -hmm. I can see what you mean. You know, you got something that, they need to come back down that road, right? Well, it's like that quote, right? Yes. You go down another road. Yeah, yeah, just turn an about face. And I'm not saying, I'm just generally speaking, how many times have, it's painful to turn around. You go, man, I, you know, have you ever been down before GPS, you go uh, a half a night down the wrong way and you go, oh my gosh, I made the wrong turn. I, oh yes. my gosh, it's painful. I just it's keep painful. going the same wrong way. <laughs> I know, yeah, go all the way around. Well, that's what yeah. I'm saying. They're justifying their sunk investment in the CHP plan. Yeah. You know, we've got to get the most out of that. Yeah. You know what? It is. Yeah. The one good thing, and this is the question I asked them, the new campus is they're not putting in any fossil, uh, any combustion equipment in there. So what they're putting in there is fan coils that have two row fan coils, heating and cooling, so it's hydronic. So now all we got to do is make the case for uh, a heat pump to supply the heating. Now, I, I'm going to say, if they have waste heat already that they have to get rid of, why not use it until they get that whole plant to electrically powered? And that's okay. And see, I don't know the whole story. It's kind of like I was on Empire State Plaza. I didn't know the whole story and people were hitting me up and going, Jay, we want you to get involved. I go, I don't know the whole story. I don't know. And finally I did. Um, and I couldn't be quiet after that. So I don't know the full story yet, but um, yeah, <laughs> okay. And this is how it happened with Empire State Plaza and we ended up stopping a contract that was already awarded that should have been started in January. I don't know if you know that, but they still haven't done the, so they're, they're looking at a full geothermal system over there at Empire, which is a 10,000 ton Jay, system. To talk it over with you. I probably know that system and most people outside the courtroom. Right. Um, and it, it is complicated. I, I will give them that. And, and you can attest that there are certain points to the way it's operating where they have waste heat that they would want to use somewhere. They do, and that is really complicated. Yeah. And there's also... And see, that's why I like the caveat. Right now, and they, the chill water plant is very efficient. It's like over... Oh my gosh, 20 COP? Yeah. yeah. Including... Uh, and they are designing it to the 130 degrees, which... The, the new stuff is to the 130 degree heated water, which is, is super easy for heat pumps. 
Right. Yeah, yeah, that's that's why they're doing that. Right. It's, you know, just have to have larger coils. It's not that easy to do that. Yeah. I would like to talk to you about that conversion you mentioned. Yeah. Because we looked at that quite a bit, and it, it, you, you pretty much need twice as much heat to, surface. Yeah. You've got to, sometimes you have to change the whole fan coil to do it, yeah. And I understand that, and uh, I mean, I say I understand that. I don't understand the big scope of what you're dealing with, and that's why I always say, I don't know what they're looking at, but I, I know it's doable. Another really interesting point is what emissions factor to use mm -hmm. for the, the natural gas usage, mm -hmm. and how to, how to figure that with the, the new, if you're putting it in Right. So there's there's a big discussion about which one to use, and it, it, there's a difference. It's quite a difference in the emissions factors depending on whether you're using an average one or non-base load or the fossil fuel emissions that you can. there's the rub. There's the rub, right? And there, it's it's uh, controversial or, or not. Cut not for electrons. They're not that smart. <laughs> <laughs> I I. Uh, you know what, I'm, I'm all ears because this, this really matters. These are the kind of things that, you know, I sat there, these people have worked, it's Steve Byers, I love Steve Byers, he's with Cornell. He sat over there at Empire State Plaza and made the case with me to the NIPA engineers. And I can't go into the details of that because it's confidential, <clears throat> I promised him I wouldn't. But he was there at Cornell. There is. There, that's why you have to be wise, but stand your ground, you know. And and so I was pleased to hear that all of the new places will be hydronic, which means it's they're not using. It. So I think we just have to steer the right way. I've spoken with Steve a lot about this. Yeah. Setup. Good. And Good engine. The one who's made the presentation to the town planning board. Yeah. 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 Yeah, and I don't, again, I don't know all the details of that and how much waste heat they have and how quickly they can do the conversions, but I know Ball State converted from coal and gas to completely geothermal in eight years. And Stanford did the same thing. They went off CHP to shared energy very quickly, and it's happening more and more. So, and I think... these are higher education yeah. institutions. Yeah said the former provost. Right. Yeah. Talking about leadership here. Yeah. Right. And I I've think, written about the Ball State you have, in yeah. my book on campus sustainability. I so I'm very familiar with it. Uh, Jeff uh, Erlab with MEP also was in the NIPA meeting. And he was, uh, so we had some uh, movers and shakers in there. We should have had you in there too. <laughs> but, no, uh, I'm not that technical. But I know how many holes it took to drill. Yeah. And you know what? When you have surface water, the holes uh, are suddenly almost nothing. Not a problem. Yeah, yeah. Surface water is brilliant. And we have some of that. We do have some of that, don't we? Mm -hmm. So you see us kind of, because we don't know, the. I think somebody in here knows the whole story. I don't know the whole story. So I'm a little bit cautious, and I know Dr. Tester and his team is trying to do the right thing. And I've heard people say, is the tail wagging the dog? I know that's happened to me sometimes. You get so fixed on something. So that's why I reserve full judgment. They're on somewhat the right track, but I would prefer to see a fully geothermal system because that lake water is a great source. So I don't know how complicated that would be though. So, so anyway, I'd like to end it here because Jay actually presented in Binghamton this morning. He met at Cornell this afternoon. He's presenting here, and then he's eating. Hopefully, we're going to be able to feed him. And then he's going over to Oneonta after that. So got a SUNY tour tomorrow over there. Thank you. Hey, you see me? Wind me up. I'll go as long as you want. Thank you.